A king in this lifetime has two assignments. It's to create and to steward. We need to create things, and as entrepreneurs, we create things. But one thing a lot of entrepreneurs don't get is they don't understand the stewardship part of it. Okay. They think it's like, man, I've got bills to pay. I need to go make more money. Okay. But what about stewarding the level that you're in? What about stewarding the relationships that you have right now? So every decision that I make, every investment that I make, every time that I say yes to somebody like you, I ask myself, would I do a TV show on YouTube would a man of integrity, honor, and accountability go and do that seven-figure squad show? And I asked myself, wow. Wow. yeah, he would, because that show is about integrity, it's about honor, and it's about accountability. It's about people being the best that they can be. Show other people that you know how to do it and then teach them to do the same thing. You're doing a form of discipleship right now. Mm. Align yourself with people who also value what you value and then learn how to make money with them. Because I've made alignments with people based upon making money and those have always fallen apart. And then I've made alignments based upon people that value what I value and have vision like I have vision and want to serve like I want to serve. And those businesses have always been successful. Was just, that was a master class right there, man. <laughs> Never short stopping, now I'm winning like I'm Jida. Steady through the rigor. Yeah, I'm getting bigger. So my guest today on the Seven Figure Squad is from Terry Hall, Indiana. A graduate of the University of Illinois, fighting Illini, Super Bowl champion in the New York Giants. And if you've seen his program, Armageddon, which has got done with the killer workout program here, is right here with us today. On this episode, Steve Weatherford, welcome to the Seven Figure Squad, brother. Appreciate Man, you being it, here. It's good to be here, and I just I love the content that you're creating, and I love yeah. the fact that that you live here now. You know, and yeah, I, I love yeah. I love aligning with people who believe like I believe, mm -hmm. who have a mission like I have a mission, and and value the same things that I yeah. value. And in the two months that we've gotten to create this partnership and this yeah. uh, this brotherhood here in Frisco, to have you come to my, <laughs> my church now and be able to get to do life at that capacity, man, I'm just, yeah. I'm really excited for what the future has for us. And I'm yeah. honored to be here to to yeah. share with your guests on, uh, on YouTube what God has done in my life and the things I've done that were great, yeah. that I want everybody here to like take that, that seed and plant it in fertile soil and nurture it and get the same wins that I win. But there's been some mistakes that I've made in my life as well, some coping mechanisms, some behavioral patterns, and some addictions that I've formed uh, that have retarded the, the, the blessings and have blocked the blessings that I believe that God has for me. And, uh, and about three and a half years ago, man, I had like a radical God moment. And, um, and I truly believe that I've been like set on fire and, and no longer do I care about the judgments of other people. I mean, when I was in the NFL for 10 years, um, I used to care so much about mm -hmm. what the 100,000 people in the stands thought of me or, or my teammates or my wife or my coaches. And I was scared to death. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people can probably connect with feeling like an imposter. I was in the NFL and still feeling like an imposter to the point where, dude, I would vomit at yeah. the beginning of every single game. Like while wow. the national anthem was happening, I had a manager that was standing behind me holding a, a bucket okay. because he knew that my nerves were going to make me vomit as soon as the national anthem was over. So sorry to go on, on a little <laughs> bit of a rant, but I just want you guys to know how thankful I am to have your attention, how thankful I am to have your friendship yeah. and, to, and to be aligned with you for a purpose that's bigger than you and me. Amen to that. You know, Steve, uh, I... To give credit, I uh, just moved to Dallas from Chicago, and you're a recent uh, yeah. transplant here yeah. too as well. Come from uh, uh, San Diego, correct, mm -hmm. San Diego? Mm -hmm. And so I, uh, in my networking of things, you know, I'm here to make new friends. I'm always talking about, you know, I always tell my guys when I'm coaching them and mentoring them, and be a mayor every time, get around town, shake mm -hmm. some hands, meet some people. And so I met, uh, so Jason Elias is part of the value taming community. He's a, he's a, he's a, a frequent attendee of my mentors programs. And then through him, I met Matt, mm -hmm. Marines. So yeah, we, we get yeah, Matt Signer. Matt Signer. My guy. And so, and then so I was thinking about, hey, because you know, we're talking about, hey, uh, uh, you think about going to church around here? I said, oh, absolutely, I'm thinking about going to church around. I just haven't had, uh, you know, found a home church yet. Mm. And said, uh, but I was thinking about going to the church called Elevate. This is, they're like, yo, it's right here in Frisco. Yeah. And then, and, uh, yeah, I was thinking about uh, down there connecting with this guy named Steve. What Weatherford? And then Matt's like, I know him. I was like, no, get out of here. Come on. Yeah, it was just, it was just a weird, you know, yeah. evolution of uh, conversation. Okay. You know, playing poker, no gambling, but we were just playing poker for with fake chips, of course. But uh, it was just a weird evolution of conversation that happened, and uh, it's amazing what happens when uh, you set out to say, Hey, God, you know, how, how are you going to use me today? Mm -hmm. I mean, here, here we are together. So, uh, take, take me back, uh, take me back, Steve. Um, your father was more. Uh, would you say a uh, hardcore Christian uh, mm. growing up? What, what was that relationship like with your, with your pops? Because I know yeah. that's an area of, uh, I'm going to 
gained my dad's approval, and yeah. I, think, I think me and many other men also relate to that. Yeah, my dad was amazing, Dad. Yeah. I, I honor my father, and I believe like a lot of us have fathers that, in some areas, and, and some of us might not even have fathers, but fa father figures who showcase to you character attributes that made you really want to be like them. And then there were maybe some components or some behavioral patterns or maybe some addictions that our fathers had that we maybe began to resent our father for. But then as I grew older, I started to see a lot of those things start to surface in me. And to kind of answer your question, I grew up with, you know, a Midwest dad that, that loved Jesus, but he didn't exactly know how to show it, you know? And so he, without knowing it, he withheld a lot of like affirmation for me. And I was constantly, I set so many different goals for myself. And we were talking right before we started lifting weights. I was 108 pounds when I was a freshman in high school, like <laughs> the skinniest guy in my class. But I knew um, that if I dedicated myself to the weight room, I could, I could be the best that I could be because I knew that I was athletic. Like I, I was, I was able to make the teams, but I wasn't able to be elite on any of the different teams that I was on because I lacked that elite size and strength. And so I dedicated myself exactly to what you just experienced out there, just developing myself, yeah. but not just physically, um, but mentally as well. And I was able to take two, I believe there's five really important pillars of life, you know, mentally, yeah. physically, emotionally, financially, and spiritually. And at 14 years so old- council five pillars, right? Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, it. Yeah. So those are five things that we really focus on. And I went all in on developing my, my mental capacity and my, my ability to focus, and then also my physical ability. So by the time I graduated high school, I went from 108 pounds to 225 pounds. Um, and graduated, walked across the stage, and I remember there being a rumor in my hometown, and my dad called me into his office um, right around graduation, and he said, uh, he said, Steve, I wanna to talk to you. And this is the best compliment I've ever gotten from my dad, and, and I honor my father, but he just didn't know how to, yeah. to affirm me and, yeah. and compliment and, and encourage me, because his father wasn't that mm -hmm. to him. And so this is the best compliment I got to my dad. He called me at school, so I had to like, it was before cell phones, I had to go to the office, and I picked up my phone, or I picked up the phone in the assistant's office and he said, hey, I need you to come to my office after school. And I'm like, oh crap. What'd your dad do? Uh, uh, he was an executive cost analysis. So oh, he was wow. like an accountant. Okay. So his, his office was real close to mine or to the school. So I drove over there and I kind of like slowly walked into his office. He goes, and he was like, with a really loving tone. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I'm really in trouble because he's never like this. <laughs> he's he, set go, up. he goes, Steve would, uh, he just sit, sit down, I, I wanna to talk to you. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm really in yeah. trouble. He goes, hey, I've, uh, I've heard some rumors around town that, um, and I'm not mad at you, but I just wanna get you help. I've heard some rumors around town that you're taking steroids and, um, and I'm not mad at you, but I wanna get you help. And I remember initially like being like really offended and like wanting to like lash back. And then I sat back into my chair and I thought to myself, I'm like, my dad thinks that I have done something with myself that is impossible to do without cheating. And I remember telling my dad, I go, dad, you might not believe me, but I've done this 100% the right way. Natural. Yeah, 100%. Um, and I'll take a test right now. And he goes, I take your word for it. Good job. And I walked out. And that was like the biggest compliment that I've ever had from my dad was not I love good, you, job. But good job. Yeah, just good job. I don't know if he, he necessarily believed me. And then another interaction, okay. I believe, you know, you fast forward literally 10 yeah. years later and we just won the Super Bowl. You know, we just beat Tom Brady in Indianapolis, Indiana. And I'm thinking to myself, like, oh, man, like once I hand this Lombardi trophy to my dad and we're 47 miles from where I went to high school, like my dad's definitely going to say, like, I'm so proud of you, son. And I know like a lot of people could probably or maybe connect with achieving something in your life. Mm -hmm. And it might be money, it might be, it might be a car, it might be a house, it might be a thing, mm -hmm. or it might be a status. And you get it, and then you realize it, it didn't make you feel di any different. I worked so hard to be able to get in the NFL. I worked so hard to become the fittest man in the NFL twice. I became, I worked so hard to be Walter Payton Man of the Year Community Servant Award. I worked so hard to become a Super Bowl champion. And so you, you, you set all these things up, but I, looking back on my life, those were all predicated off of like getting my dad's attention, wow. you know? Um, and so like one of the most depressing nights of my life was the night that we beat Tom Brady in the Super Bowl. And I had four punts that game 
and uh, had the best game of my entire life every single time that Tom Brady went onto the field after my punt. It was inside of his 10-yard line or inside of his 5-yard line. So, I mean, granted, guys, as you guys watch this on YouTube, like, I'm a punter, okay? Yeah. Like, <laughs> usually punters don't sway the game that much. Or look like this. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, it's like, it was just such a supernatural event that happens in your life where you have the best game of your life and the biggest game of your life. Your mom's there, your dad's there, your wife's there, your son's there. I remember pulling my son out at four years old, four and a half years old, confetti's coming down and he was old enough to know and he said, Dad, we did it. We won the Super Bowl. Whoa. And I'm like pouring, crying tears. And then I got Al Roker comes up behind me and pulls my shirt and I don't know who it is. I turn around, Al Roker's got a microphone and he's interviewing me about my performance. Matt, Matt, I'm a punter, dude. This is not, this is not real life, you not know? Not the kicker. The, yeah, it's right. a kicker, but right. you're a punter, right? I'm a punter. I don't yeah. even score points, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, and so it's my turn to get the trophy and take a picture with my family on the stage. And I remember handing that trophy to my dad and him saying, like, that's nice. Like, show your mom. Like, not even holding it, not even, like, Jeez. not, like. And, and the thing that I make up in my mind is... And I want everybody to hear this. This is not me bashing my dad. This is me realizing and, and really kind of sharing with you all, my dad was to me what his dad was to him. And so really the, the message I believe the Holy Spirit wants to convey maybe in this episode is that every single one of us gets to be the one. Like we all get to be the one that decides that we're the one that's gonna shift our family tree. Mm. You know, not mm. just like, the first one yeah. to, to make a million dollars. What about the first one to give a million dollars? Like that to me, that's like legacy. That to yeah. me, that's something that when, when I'm called up and maybe I get called up in 60 years, maybe it's seven years, maybe it's tomorrow, Matt. But I wanna know when I, when I show up, yeah. I wanna be able to walk up and I wanna be able to pull my pockets out just like Nate was talking about before we yeah. got going. That's not on camera, but maybe he'll splice that we'll in. We'll splice it in, it's not a camera. Yes. He went away and as he returned, he said, what did you do with what I gave you? And the first one said, hey, I took the five you gave me and I doubled it. And the other guy said, hey, I took the two that you gave me and I doubled it. And the last one said, I took the one you gave me and I was fearful. I knew that you collected things as a master that you didn't work on, that you didn't sew into. You, you just brought things back to you. So I was fearful. I took that, I hid it, I buried it. And here is your one talent back. And he said, you wicked and you lazy and you unfaithful, you fearful servant. You misjudged me. You thought I was a man who operated out of fear, but I operate out of faith. faith. And you didn't put that money somewhere. You could have at least put it in the bank Thanks. and come back with some interest and given that back to me. But instead, you brought nothing back. So I'm going to take this one talent. I'm going to give it to the one who took the five and Preach. the ten. I'm going to give it to him because he's been a good steward. So one of the principles you said was be a good steward. Another one you said was don't operate out of fear. And another thing was when you get good advice, take action immediately. I just got some good advice from Steve Weatherford here. He said, if you want to get a pump, if you want to grow your biceps, take action on getting a pump. So. <laughs> hey, I'm getting up out of this chair. You need to be interviewing him. <laughs> that in because he was speaking a word about God giving us things. And if you're hearing this right now, bro, God's given you the gift of being able to hear. Yeah. If you're seeing this right now, God's given you the gift to be able to see me right now. And so I just want you to feel me when I say this, that, that God has a plan for you, that the adversities that you're in right now are something that you're supposed to get into the arena. You're not supposed to run away from them. You're supposed to get in the, the arena with them and you're supposed to fight them because that enemy is, is the thing that's gonna promote you to your next level. Because I truly believe this, if we do what we're capable of doing, and part of that's getting in the weight room, part of that's stewarding our money, part of that's stewarding our relationship. If we do what we're capable of doing, God will do the impossible. And so that's what I've dedicated my life to, not to fitness. I haven't dedicated my life to, to finances. Yeah. I've dedicated my life to possibility because I know that I'm gonna have more influence for the King of Kings. I'm gonna have more influence for people to live their best life if I go out and develop myself and teach other men how to develop themselves so they can go out and take territory because a king in this lifetime has two assignments. It's to create and to steward. We need to create things and as entrepreneurs, we create things. But one thing a lot of entrepreneurs don't get is they don't understand the stewardship part of it. Okay. They think it's like, man, I've got bills to pay. I need to go make more money. Yeah. But what about stewarding the level that you're in? What about stewarding the relationships that you have right now? Because, because God wants to promote yeah. all of us, but until we steward what we're capable of stewarding, that promotion will never come.
I want to go back to your, your, your pops because I, I feel the same way too with, with my dad, you know, Filipino dad. And my dad was raised in, uh, in Manila during the bombing of mm. Manila and uh, lost his mom. Nobody talks about how we lost my grandmother, his mother. And um, the only time my father really spoke to me was when I was screwing up. Right. You know, I did something wrong. When, you know, I think I may have seen him at uh, one football game, a couple practices here, but after, outside of that, don't really, you know, recall. And I was trying to get my attention on my dad. And I was nothing, you know, close to your athletic level in high school because I was still, you know, a very slim, trim, you know, female model-esque 6'1", 140. <laughs> And by the too. way, by the way, he's the biggest Filipino fella I have ever seen in my life, man. You, hey, you know what I talked about? Decide that you're the one in your family. You're the one. You're the one in your family. <laughs> <laughs> Big shout out to my Filipinos out there. Filipino American yeah, History man. Month is October. But uh, I found myself, and, and by the way, I feel blessed that my father's still here because Mil Milton's man. here, uh, my good friend and trainer, and you know the Lord called his father home. And, and when I, every time I look at Milton and I, I remind myself my dad is still here, yeah, you know, man. and, and I'm, I'm a big brother to him, and, and I, I couldn't imagine what it's like to be in my friend's right. shoes, right? And so, but still, I'm, I'm still trying to get the attention of my dad. Yeah. I remember I got promoted on stage in Las Vegas. Of course, we have an awards gala, you know, at our, at our convention. And uh, by one of these times, I'd, you'd, I'd love for you to be my invited guest to our awards gala. It's in Vegas, I love at the it. MGM I Grand. Love it. And we had um, Nikki Jam out there this year. Yeah. We had Kevin Hart, you know, yeah. Kobe Bryant, sadly, before he passed away. Out, so. Come on. Please, and then, um, and uh, anyway, make a long story short, um, my dad goes, hey, you know, I've been, I've been trying to get, to, hey dad, I love you, I love you, mm hmm mm hmm dad, I love you, mm hmm me too. Come on dad, I love you, mm hmm Yeah. Because I have kids too, and I tell them I love you all the time, and right. I, I, as a dad, I'm like, how am I not receiving this from my own dad? I'm giving yeah. it to my kids, I'm, I'm looking at my kids, and, but he did say, hey listen, you got promoted, so I walk on stage, if I haven't told you lately, just wanna let you know, Proud of you, mm. <laughs> dude. <laughs> I'm like, thanks, prison. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it was that moment, yeah. and that was just as good enough to say. So, what is that? What is it about men? Because when we look at men today, mm. you know, there's is it the vulnerability that we're not able to share that we got to be rough and tough? Because I know you're very close to your son. I mean, your son's mm. doing things that uh, 20 year olds aren't doing at, at 13 years old. I mean, my son's yeah. doing things that <laughs> men, period, don't do. You know, is it uh, you know, what, what can we do better today? In your opinion, your observation of men today in, in this crazy environment that we're mm -hmm. in pandemic, you know, Republican, you know, liberal, conservative, Democrat. What, what can we do today better as men is your observation? Uh, it's a great question. And one thing that that I believe is like foundational uh, for the men that, that we lead, I do. Uh, I do men's legacy leadership coaching. It's called King's Council. And the first thing I take men through is I, I help them to establish their launching pad. So I want everybody, um, as you guys are watching this, if you're driving, don't do this and maybe rewatch this again, but take a piece of paper and just draw a square on it. And then I want you to break it up into four different quadrants. In the top left quadrant, I want you to write identity. In the top white, right quadrant, I want you to write purpose. In the, in the bottom left, I want you to write what matters most. And in the fourth quadrant, I want you to write discipline. So those are the things. Now I want to go through them. So the first one is identity. And I think in order for us to recondition our sons, we must recondition ourselves. So like a lot of us want to sit on Twitter and, and type away about the things that we hate or the things that we don't like or this with the politics. Rant, rant or, away. Yeah. yeah. But what are we willing to do to change it? And a lot of people aren't willing to do anything. It's and, easy even, to and even a smaller percentage of those people are willing to make change in themselves in order to see change in their family, in order to create change in their business or their community or their region or their nation. And so it really comes down to accountability. So at the end of the day, like we have to ask ourselves, like, well, what's my identity? And so if you guys are like, okay, well, I don't know what mine is, I'll share mine with you and you can use this possibly as a template for like, how do I create my own, uh, my own identity, Matt or Steve? Yeah. So my name's Steve Weatherford. I'm a man of integrity, honor, and accountability. I'm a son and a servant of the one most high. Yes, so, you are! My man. So if you'll notice what Nate did, uh, Nate stood in agreement with me. And I believe that's one thing that men don't do for each other. They don't stand in agreement. So if I were to speak something over myself or speak something out of my mouth, unless I have somebody to stand in agreement with it, because that's biblical. Yeah, yeah, Hear yeah. me when I say that. Yeah. When any two of you so much as touch anything in my name, I'll do it for you. Wow. That's what God that's says. That's so, right. yep. so me, dude, I'm a football player. I'm, and even like kind of lower on the totem pole, I'm a punter. 
So I'm not speaking to you from some super high expertise or wisdom. I'm talking to you from the best-selling book of all time, from the Bible and the truths that I've found in that I've applied into my life and it has been able to produce me fruit. And now I'm able to, to show that followable excellence to other men in my life and they're able to produce fruit. So back to this first quadrant of identity. So that's my identity. So every decision that I make, every investment that I make, every time that I say yes to somebody like you, I ask myself, is this a man, would I do a TV show on YouTube? Would a man of integrity, honor, and accountability go and do that seven figure squad show? And I asked myself, wow. Wow. yeah, he would, because that show is about integrity, it's about honor, and it's about accountability. It's about people being the best that they can be. So I know that this is a fruitful investment of my time. I'm not spending it here, I spend my time on Netflix. I invest my time into something here oh, because man, somebody Lord. could watch this video a year from now and establish their identity in Jesus Christ and everything will Amen. change. So that's the first quadrant. Once you know who you are and the second quadrant is that's your purpose. Like what are we supposed to do here on this earth? And mine is very simple. It was the second part of my contract. I said I'm a man of integrity, honor and accountability, right? So that's the filter with which I make decisions or I speak words. Yeah. Now, my purpose. I know who I belong to. I know who I am with my identity. I know whose I am, who I belong to. My purpose is to go out and make disciples, go out and teach men and teach women and teach families how to do it the, the way the Bible says to do it, how to, how to live your life with structure, with order, and how to be accountable to something bigger than what you are. So that's the second one. That's my purpose, to go out, make disciples, and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, mm. and the Holy Spirit, in addition to teaching them everything that God has commanded of us. So that's the second one. Now the third one is what matters most. So until you understand what matters most to you, and for me, those are my core values. And so understand core values aren't something that like you and I just go to like Etsy and we like pick yeah. something cute to decorate our home. Like as you guys watch this video and maybe you watch this video two times and go through it with the notepad and just write down a couple things that that mean a lot to you, like what matters most to you? What do you want to be known for? And so my wife and I got together and we came into alignment with what matters most to us. And that's what we established our family on. And the first one, and I'll just give you guys my five examples of my core values. And the first one is positive attitude. The reason I chose positive attitude is because I'm an athlete, man. I have played with people who have had negative attitudes and I've literally never seen any of them do anything great. So positive attitude is the first core value of our family because we're gonna bring a positive attitude into everything. And the second one is excellence. The reason we chose excellence is like, I don't want mediocrity in my life. So the way that the Weatherfords do anything is the way that Weatherfords do everything. And the next one is leadership. And the reason it's leadership is because you don't want your family running in the back of the pack. Like I'm built to run in the front. We're all built to run in the front. That doesn't mean I can't follow someone because I'm following someone I'm getting mentored right now. You know, so that's leadership, generosity. The reason we chose generosity is I believe when you're generous, you're most like God. And the last one, you know, for me is patience because in order for me to be all that I believe that God is calling me to be. I have to be patient and I have to steward the level that I'm at. Cause I'm like you, man, I want to go create eight figures and nine figures. And the reason why is dude, I want to be able to cut yes. the biggest check in my church. Yeah. And there are some ballers in my church. <laughs> it's not about competing with them. Yeah. Remember we talked about, yeah. we talked about possibility. Mm -hmm. So if it can be done, let your life be an example to other men and other families of what's possible when somebody gives their entire life not just their heart, their entire life, their finances, their body, to honoring the King of Kings because you're gonna have a whole lot more influence mm -hmm. if you do what you're doing now than if you stand out there on the highway and, and wave a sign that says, Jesus saves, let me help you invest your money. That's not gonna be effective. Show other people that you know how to do it and then teach them to do the same thing. You're doing a form of discipleship right now. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm investing time here with you. So those are the five things that matter most to you. Wow. So we've just gone through those three sections that matter most for your launching pad. And the last one, a lot of people don't want to hear this, man. It's discipline. Woo! You know what I mean? Like right. discipline means, you yeah. know what? I'm committing to this and I'm going to be what I say I'm going to be. Um, and that's the most difficult part of this launching pad. The reason I describe these four different quadrants for you guys Huge. is because we all want to launch. We all want to launch a business. We all want to launch new relationships. We all want to launch like a new campaign for a new body. And I don't know when you're watching this video right now, but I know you're watching this video because you want to do something more. So in order to do that, in order for you to launch, just think about NASA. Before NASA launches a rocket, 
obviously they're going to put people inside of it, right? Because like we want to get the right people on the rocket ship to get to the goal, whatever your goal is. Yep. So the first thing you got to do is get the right people on your rocket ship. But before you blast off, you have to calibrate these four components of this launching pad yeah. because if you're off one degree on one component on one component of this launching pad down here, you're going to be a hundred thousand miles off when you get to your goal. <laughs> so, like before you launch, before you take action, yeah. make sure that you're aligned with the right people. So, if you're watching this video right now, you're aligned with a yeah, mentor. Yeah. You're aligned with two of them right now. Both and so what we want to speak into your life is your alignments will determine your assignments. And a lot of people watching this might have come to this video because they want to make more money. And that's amazing. I want to make more money too. But understand, don't make your alignments based upon the assignments of making more money. Make your alignments with people who value what you value. Remember that third component, what matters most mm -hmm. to you? Align yourself with people who also value what you value and then learn how to make money with them. Because I've made alignments with people based upon making money and those have always fallen apart. And then I've made alignments based upon people that value what I value yeah. and have vision like I have vision and want to serve like I want to serve. And those businesses have always been successful. That was, that was a master class right there, man. <laughs> it's a master class right there. Just chop that one out. It's just a standalone video right there. But Bob, if you are watching this right now, which of these four, those four quadrants matter to you right now? Put in the comment section about what automatic is coming out right now. Obviously, we're in the safety. If you're watching this in the car, pull over. Make sure you do this in the utmost amount of safety uh, possible. Put, put your feedback right. Put what you have got on your mind uh, at this very moment while it's fresh in your mind. Um, let me go back to discipline because you're talking about launch codes. I gather of all the punters in college, I mean, you were undrafted. Mm. I, mean, you, I mean, you ended up with the, you know, New Orleans Saints, right? That was right. Issue. And then you got cut and then you, you, went, you went to other. I mean, uh, Giants was like your fourth, fifth team. Mm -hmm. And then you became a champion. Yeah. So new punters are coming out every year. New legs are coming out every year. There's camp legs and there's the legs that they're keeping. High amount of discipline because it's not, it's not like any roster keeps two punters right. or two two kickers. Or, yeah. Th there's 32 jobs in the world. Right. <laughs> that's right. Right. That's it. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's not like there's four wide receivers. You know, at least they'll be one of the fifth or sp play special teams. I right. mean, so how does how do you attribute the discipline necessary to be a punter? It's it's uh, not a necessary glorified position, but obviously Al Roker thought. Yeah, I think he even said that you could potentially even be the MVP. Yeah, <laughs> yeah game, it right? was a, I didn't I didn't hear this until you know like a couple of days later um, when I was watching the TV copy of the game. But at the halftime of the game, uh, Al Roker or not Al Roker, it was Chris Collinsworth and Al Michaels at halftime said if we were voting for an MVP of Super Bowl 46 at halftime, it would be the punter Steve Weatherford. And normally in the NFL, uh, they have the the game or different NFL games going on in the TV inside of the locker room but during the Super Bowl they didn't do that because they mm -hmm. wanted us to maintain our focus and I'm so glad because yeah. if I would have heard that in the locker room I would have had to change my pants dude, because <laughs> that just doesn't <laughs> happen man you know what I mean to be the first player ever um, to be a but yeah so to your question about the the discipline required I, I believe it's it's just like everybody that's that's watching this right now like yeah. We want to make more money, right? Like I believe that's a seven-figure squad. That's like a, a, a big intention for, for the guys watching this right now and the gals watching this right now. And, and that's incredibly important, but you have to start to make decisions now predicated off of where you want to be. And so when I was in high school and I wanted to be a pro, yep. I started to watch how the pros would walk around and warm up on the sidelines because you only, get to, you only get to see a punter or a kicker play like, I don't know, three or four plays a game. So mm -hmm. I'd sit there and watch a three hour game and only get to watch them three or four times. And so I would come, I would make sure that I watched halftime because you could watch the punters warm up in the back. And so that was, you didn't have the internet then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was the only way that I could study a pro. And so really what I want people to hear is not how to be a better punter. It's how to be better at what you want to do and you're doing it right now. Yeah. Like you're watching you, you are great at what you do. And so you're teaching other people how to be great at it. And so you're in the process right now. Now, one thing I want to discourage you from doing is watching the next video right after this. Like, don't just be a hearer of the word. Be a doer of the deed. We said it at the beginning of this episode. Be the type of person that gets in the arena with your struggle yeah. because until you slay that giant, you cannot pass. Like think about this, think about your life as being like a video game. 
right? You and I, like, we love video <laughs> games, you know what I mean? Our kids love them more than we do now because we're doing our dang thing, right? Who, who, who's your team on Tecmo Bowl? Uh, oh, dude, Walter Payton was unstoppable. Oh, oh, come on, baby. Bo ja How about Bo, Bo Jackson? Jackson? Raiders? Uh, dude, it's so <laughs> sick. Couldn't catch him. But, like, imagine you and I are playing a video game, and at the end of every board, there's a boss. And some of us have gotten stuck on, like, level seven. Mm. You know, level seven might be alcohol for you. Level seven might be like Percocets for you. Level seven might be pornography. I just rattled off three things that like may or may not relate to any of you guys. All three of those related to me. So understand this. I'm not like speaking to you guys as somebody who's like squeaky clean. Dude, I, I, I saw my first pornography video when I was 12 years old and six months after that I got sexually abused. Like it was almost like I was predestined to have like issues, right? And in addition to like constantly trying to get that attention and affirmation from my dad. So like during a lot of the things that I rattled off to you guys that were like amazing achievements, mm -hmm. I didn't really enjoy any of them. Yeah. Because the reason I was achieving them is because I needed some, I needed the affirmation of someone or something outside of myself. And the, the most powerful, most important person that we all have for ourselves is, is our dad. You know, and so when I talked about it at the beginning of this episode where my life radically changed was uh, three and a half years ago, I was at a men's conference um, and I had just started to go back to church. Um, I got saved when I was 11. I don't know if anybody watching this remembers the power team, but the power team was like a, like a bunch of strong men that used to go from city to city and arena to high school stadium. And they used to put on these feats of strength, bending bars over their head and ripping phone books in half. And then they would, um, then they would share their personal testimony, and invite people to, to have Jesus come into wow. their life. So at 11, I received Jesus and the main speaker's name was Keith Kraft. <laughs> And so um, you guys heard a little bit of my story going to the NFL sure. and University of Illinois and everything, but this is after I retired from the NFL, moved my family out to San Diego. And this is really where like God got really real to me, Matt. Like before it was like religion, you know, like mm -hmm. God was something that was in the Bible and he was somebody that was watching you. And if you made mistakes, he was, oh, I saw that, Steve. Oh, yep, you watch, you watch porn again? Oh, you took another Percocet? Mm. Oh, you lied to your wife? Hmm. I see that. That was something that always just made me feel bad when I went to church. But um, I continued to, to hear people at this church in San Diego, California, talk about like the Holy Spirit. And mm -hmm. I'm like, so what's this like? Oh, they're like, oh, that's, it's just the Spirit of God that's here on the earth. You can't see it, but you could feel it. Yeah. And, and they, they were like, hey, do you want to feel it? I'm like, I want to feel something, dude. I'm taking Percocets. I hate myself. I'm like full of shame and guilt. And I'm like, I want to feel something. And so they said, hey, come to this Emerge event. Like, dude, it's going to be radical. So there's 2,000 men out in the middle of the mm -hmm. desert. And I got special permission for my 11-year-old son, and he's 13 now, his name's Ace, to come with me. And, uh, and it was just a really cool weekend where we competed in a bunch of like tug of war, just like a bunch of man games, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then at night they would have incredible speakers. And on the very first night they had the keynote speaker. And I'm sitting about halfway back in the tent next to my son. Um, and then my best buddy, Nick Unsworth, and the speaker comes out and they announce his name, they introduce him and they hand him the mic. And as soon as he speaks into the mic, Matt, it was like the most, and I've done a lot of drugs and I've partied and I've won Super Bowls and dude, I've, you know, I went the whole route with women and everything. I've experienced like a lot of brain chemicals mm -hmm. in, in my mm -hmm. life. And the feeling that I had when, when the speaker spoke into the mic was everything off, all the euphoria and like, like sensations multiplied by 10 all at once. And it was wow. like my skin started yeah. like crawling, but not in like a bad way. It was yeah. like, I felt like I was like levitating. Yeah. And I was like, what's this guy's name? And I asked my buddy Nick and he said, oh, his name's Keith Kraft. And I'm like, I, well, I didn't even recognize his name. So I Googled his name and the first picture that pops up, Matt, is this dude busting bricks in Jesus' name. And I'm like, that's the That's guy. The guy. <laughs> And so my yeah. mind is spinning and he's up there preaching with his son and I can't hear anything he's yeah. saying. It was like, yeah. you ever remember the Muppet Babies? Whenever the mom would talk to the Muppet Babies, it would be like, wow, 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 wow. Sure. That's how it was. Oh. Like I was like out of my body yeah. and I'm Googling it and I'm like, and then I looked at the date of today and then I realized this is the same year. It's been 25 years oh, since I've saw the, wow. so then he got done 
and I ran to the front of the, the circus tent, it was literally a circus tent, and I'm throwing these guys out of the way, like <laughs> biblically, grab them around like the head, throw them out of the way. So I get to the front of them and I go up to Keith, and Keith's like, I'm a big guy, I'm 6'3", he's 6'6", six, six, like 280, and I'm like, Pastor Keith, you're never gonna believe this, and I vomited my entire Wikipedia page out, and I'm like, <laughs> because everything changed after I met him, and I want everybody to, to hear me when I say this, it wasn't just me receiving Jesus that changed everything. Yes, it changed everything because I knew that I was going to live forever in that moment. And that's when, that's when Jesus becomes your savior. Mm -hmm. Like he saves you in mm -hmm. that moment. But something, something different can happen when you meet somebody in a divine appointment the way that I met Keith Kraft. Because when I was 11, I saw the possibility of a Christian because I had never seen a Christian speak that way. I'd never seen a Christian in cut off sleeves and breaking <laughs> things. Like I my view of Christians were always guys that like wore khakis and buttoned their shirt in and they, they were just weak. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, they're, they're, they're just weak and they weren't the guys that were the leaders. They uh -huh. were the, you know, they just didn't win. Yeah. You know, and then I saw this guy, I'm like, this is like a WWF wrestler yeah. slash preacher. I want some of that. Yeah. And then 25 years later, this guy comes back into my life and he's just as impressive as he was 25 years ago. Like he has still been doing the same things and not just preaching the same word, like the same principles that he was preaching for financial philosophies, for relationship philosophies, for physical fitness philosophies. Here he is 25 years later and he's in better shape. And now he's wow. got his son on the stage and yeah. that was a picture of yeah. what I want my relationship with my son to be. Yeah. Like I have vision to serve the King of Kings alongside of my yeah. son, but in order for that to happen, I needed Keith Kraft to come back into my life. So I vomit all of my accomplishments. This on is in San Diego. No, yeah, this is in San Diego, out in the middle of the desert. And so after I have that conversation with Keith, he's like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. Take my number, let's talk. And so as I'm walking back to my chair, I felt like I was like walking on clouds. I'm like, this is like, God is real, yeah. you know, like I'm having like <laughs> what a, better a, high revelation, <laughs> a revelation, man. Yeah. And I walk back to my seat and I find Nick Unsworth. I'm like, Nick. And I started to explain the story to him. And I go, where's my son? And he goes, oh, dude, you're never going to believe no. it. Your son's at yeah. the front of the stage. He just gave his life to Jesus. To Keith. And through, I'm, through Keith. Through Keith. Through yeah. Keith. So think about this, guys. Wow. 11 years old, not only, not only did I get saved, but this guy gave me a snapshot, a picture of possibility. Yeah. And, and I kept that snapshot. That was like, that was something that I was like, yeah. that's the baddest Christian I've ever met. You know what I mean? And so I always had that picture in my mind because growing up, I always felt bad that I wanted to have more than one car. I always felt bad that I was attracted to Cadillacs and, yeah. and Lamborghinis. I always felt bad that I wanted a 7,000 square foot Why? house. Because I, 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 I grew up in, in all of the Christians in my church, they turned their nose up if somebody pulled into the parking lot in a Cadillac because why are you driving that when there's so many people that are hungry? Mm. Well, here's the deal, dude. If we don't activate and empower other kings to go out, create and steward, who's going to build the church? Who's going to take care of the sick? Who's going to take care of the needy? How can, if my core value is generosity, Matt, mm -hmm. how can I be generous if I don't got anything? Yeah, yeah. You know, so we have to go, it's our assignment. Yeah. And so like, I love these Northwestern com commercials about retirement. Yeah. I'm never going to retire. Thank you. Amen. It's I not, will it, never it retire. It's not biblical. We talk about that. Yeah. I Amen. will never <laughs> ever retire. I'm going to show up in heaven with nothing left. Yeah. With n with no Amen. tread left on the tire. So to bring this back to the story about Keith Kraft, I did a. We're little gonna get bit, back to that though. We're gonna get back yeah, to yeah. that. Let's I, punch that. I did a, um, I did a, I did a search to figure out what date I got saved. I found it in a book, and get this, twenty five years, to the exact day, that I got mm. saved, and then my eleven year old son at the very same age got saved. Whoa. So that was the confirmation that not only God is real, but God sent this man for me to learn from. Yeah. And that's why I live in Texas right now, because that was in San Diego. So you... And so he coached me on Zoom and mentored me for about eight months. And then I began to pray with my wife about uh, possibly getting closer to him because everything he's coaching me, man, I'm an athlete, dude, yeah. so I'm coachable. Yeah, yeah, so he's sure. coaching me. I'm just like you guys are watching this. I would watch this recording two or three times if it was from from Keith Kraft and understand this. You guys are you guys are getting to be the beneficiary of Keith Kraft's greatness through yeah, me. Man. So a lot of the things I'm sharing with you, I've learned from him. A lot of the, the, the great speakers, there's so, so much of what he's sharing with you, he learned from other mentors. And I'm not throwing you under the bus. I know you'll agree with sure, me. Of, Men, of course. Mentorships are, of course. Mentorships are the way that we get great at things that we yeah. want to be great at. If yeah. you want to, and the, and the thing is, for people watching this as well, like if you guys want to be great leaders, 
Just understand you only need to be a half a step ahead of the somebody that needs to get to where you're at. We, we're all leaders. We're all just at different levels, but you can choose to steward where you're at and, and to bring it back to finances. You can choose to steward where you're at to place, place yourself where you want to be. What an amazing story there with Keith Craft and you coming to, to now you know, t uh, Dallas, Texas and being in Frisco. Let's talk about some, some myths some Christian myths that are annoying because it doesn't get them to express really what you feel the Bible is biblically telling them to, to accomplish in their life. So what are some of the, if you were to rank them or just brainstorming and spit them all out, what would be at the top of the list? That's just annoying, like, dude, that's like you're in your own way. You're in the way of the Tithing. Holy Spirit. Okay. Tithing. Yeah. Because there's, I mean, not very, not very many times does God say, test me in this, you know, <laughs> right. it says biblically yeah. test me in this, like yeah. first fruit in God. And I believe tithing for a lot of people think that's just money. Mm -hmm. um, but just think about your day, the 86,400 seconds that you have in a day. When you wake up in the morning, if you really want God to put super on your natural first fruit, your time, your energy and your attention, like wake up and spend time with God, spend time in the devotional, spend time in prayer. And here's the deal, guys, like God's only asking for 10 cents of your dollar. So God's not gonna be mad if you give him 10 minutes in the morning. <laughs> like you don't need to be like some super spiritual, you know, on mm. your knees with the mat for 15 hours, dude. We're talking about just give God the first fruits. Yeah. Like just let him know that you're number one. Right. I want you to be in the center of everything that I do today, everything that I speak today, everything I place my hands to, may I place it to bring glory to your name. And then to me, when I operate with, with a why that's so much bigger than the goal, because a lot of times um, entrepreneurs look for key performance indicators, mm -hmm. KPIs, like yeah. how is sure. my team performing? How am I performing? How are we progressing? But, but what if our key performance indicator was the amount of time that we spend, spend with God? God. You know, I have to hand it to our Muslim cousins because um, when I was deployed overseas, I learned about uh, how they practice their faith. Yeah. Somalia, I learned about they, how they practice their faith. First thing you do when they get up, pray. Yeah. Six times a day they're praying. Constantly. And so there's, they're very disciplined yeah. as, as, a, as, a, as a faith. Yeah. So the, in Psalms 119, <clears throat> uh, 160 through 164, and we're talking about we're talking about structure mm -hmm. and we're talking about first fruit. And one thing that I'm challenging myself to do uh, in Psalms, it talks about giving praise mm -hmm. six times per day. So wow. to your Muslim brothers, yeah, yeah. I really <laughs> yeah. like the structure with yeah. which they give praise sure. to God. Yeah. Um, and so that's actually something that I've integrated into my life. It's kind of like weird. Uh, sometimes my alarm will go off and I'll just say, praise God. And people are like, what the heck's going on? But I have, a, I have an alarm that goes off yeah, yeah. Um, six times per day on a sequence. And really? I'm just retraining myself. Yeah. Dude, here's the deal. If it's in the Bible, yeah. like yeah. I, yeah. I want to test it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, here's the deal. If I do it for a year and, and it doesn't work, I'm not going to say I'll stop doing it, but maybe I'll try something else. Test. But here's the deal. What, what if, what if those promises that God put in there weren't actually able to make a miracle happen? What if those promises were to create something in us that's able to actually go out and make miracles happen? Gotcha. Right? So, yeah. so what if retraining my brain to give God the glory six times per day will actually retrain my brain to be able to think in a way that could create miracles one year from now? I don't know, but I'm going to test it yeah, out. We'll you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, it's like training. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like training a muscle. Like, why can't I train my ability to give God thanks? Yeah, your faith muscle. That's yeah. So, uh, what's, another, uh, what's another myth that's going to say that we have with inside the church that's religious? Uh, Christians can't win. You know what I mean? Like, dude, I, I'm not sure exactly what the address is of the, uh, the scripture, but when he talks about running the race to win, yeah. you know, one thing that, like, is very important in my home is for my kids to understand that winning, winning is a way of worship, you know? Winning is a way of worship because when you leverage being a champion for the King of Kings, then I think there is no, there's no being ashamed <laughs> and being the best. Now, if you're running across the finish line and it's all about you, then I'm not gonna say I have a problem with you, but I'm not gonna be rooting for you. And I don't believe that God is gonna rain down favor upon your life. I'm running the race to win, to give God the glory. So I'm not, I'm not creating businesses to make a whole lot of money to bring glory to me. I'm, I'm building businesses so I can build his house because I know if I build his house, he's gonna build mine. Yeah, amen to that, bro. Another one, give me another one. Mm. So tithing, tithing is a myth. Uh, uh, Christians can't win is another, what's another? 
a frustrating myth of uh, using God as an excuse versus a reason? I don't know if it's, it's a myth, but it's definitely something I wanted to talk about, and that's the difference between like religion and relationship. Talk to me. You know, yeah. um, I best, the, the best way I could describe it, when I was 16, um, I got my first car. My dad bought it for me. It cost $3,000. It was a 1986 Cadillac Fleetwood Brohan. I had three inch white walls. I had 15 inch Dayton's. I had two subs in the trunk. Man, what? I love this car. Out, man. Subs, dude, dude. And I, hey, Terre Haute, Indiana, dude, I didn't know that I was white until I was probably in like college. You know what I mean? I had my MLB hat on like Eminem, dude. I was, I was the deal, right? But I had the car everybody wanted to roll in because it was big. I mean, this thing was big. And, uh, and all my buddies were, were football players and stuff. And so we all liked to ride in my car. So I took such good care of this car. And remember, we're talking about the difference between religion and relationship. I love this car. Um, and we talked about how my dad was old school and he was, he was pretty tough. Um, and I remember driving this car and one of my friends was walking on the sideway going back that way. Mm -hmm. And so I went to hit a U-turn to go like pull up to him. And somebody thought behind me thought that I was turning right because I kind of swept out to the right. So long story short, as I was hitting my U-turn, he hit me right no, in the driver's I... side door. And as soon as I heard the crush, crunch, uh... I thought to myself, my dad is going to freaking <laughs> kill me. And that's like, that's how I grew up. Yeah. That was religion. That was like, if I say the F word, mm. oh, God's mad at me. If I look at pornography, oh, God hates me. If I do this, you know, it's just shame and guilt everywhere. Like, it was like I opened up the Bible and I would just feel bad. And then when I was about 35 years old and I was in San Diego and they talked to me about, mm. you know, the, the, the Holy Spirit and mm. they talked to me about creating a relationship with mm. God versus like the religion of it, right? Mm. Um, and, and the best way that I can describe the, the feeling of relationship is like, when we're driving something, when we're, when we're doing life and we're going down the road and we decide to make a turn, um, and as soon as we make that mistake and we hear that crunch, and I don't know if that's you taking the pills or drinking the alcohol or, or telling the lie, and we hear that crunch, a relationship with Jesus is, oh my gosh, I made a mistake. I need to go see my dad. Mm -hmm. He's gonna know what to do. Yeah. That's relationship. And that's what I've stepped into. And that's what I practice every morning because first fruiting God and waking up in religion just made me feel bad. And now I wake up and now I seek first the kingdom. I go to God because I know it doesn't matter how big my arms are. It doesn't matter how much money I have. That is not the purpose of life. That might be small missions that yeah. God places me on okay. to go and do and accomplish and create and steward. Yeah. But that is not my purpose. So understand Seven Figure Squad, as you guys are watching this episode right now, understand that making money is a mission. It is not a purpose. It is a vehicle for you to live your best life, whatever that looks like. If you decide to follow the King of Kings and develop a relationship and get out of religion, get into a relationship with Jesus Christ, this is how we do it, man. Mm -hmm. But it's not easy. It's hard. This is a hard lifestyle because there are, there are structure and there is order to this. But I can promise you this. It might be hard, but it's worth it. Yes. Because I've done life the yeah. other way. And I, I know we're running a little bit low on time, but could I read one more thing? Please. So this is a, this is a, a poem called The Habit Poem that I read to myself every single morning. And we talk about hard and we talk about making money. We talk about living our life for God. That's hard. And everything that I'm about to read to you are different examples of hard. And you get to choose as you listen to this or as you watch this, you get to choose what type of hard that you want in your life. Being your best is hard. Being normal is hard. Making wise decisions is hard. Making bad decisions is hard. Being in shape is hard. Being out of shape is hard. Losing weight is hard. Being fat is hard. Working out, it's hard. Being weak is hard. Being disciplined is hard. Being lazy is hard. Getting outside of your comfort zone, like after this video, taking action on what we talked about and going and drawing up your launching pad, that's hard. Starting a business, that's hard. But working for somebody else is hard too. Making a lot of money, ask Matt. It's hard. Making a little bit of money, ask Matt. It's hard. Being rich, ask Matt. It's hard. Being poor, how's that? Oh, that's harder. hard. <laughs> Having great relationships is hard. Having bad relationships is hard. Having no friends is hard. Having friends is hard. Fighting for your marriage, men and women, mm. is hard. Oh. Divorce is hard. Having a lot of things is hard. Having nothing is hard. Living on purpose is hard. Living off of purpose is hard. 
Doing life God's way is hard, but doing life any other way is hard. You got to choose your hard, family. Boom. One last thing before I let you go, um, because obviously association is a big part of recreating yourself. So is there a certain checklist that goes through your mind of who you align yourself with? Because you've mentioned alignment and assignment. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people out there that they see influencers. A lot of people today are on, on social media. But if I want to, if I'm out there watching this right now, and I'm, I'm, I'm in Chicago, or I'm in San Diego, I'm in wherever, and I want to align myself with kingdom focus, kingdom type people, what would that checklist be? If Steve Weatherford just relocated to Oregon, mm -hmm. who are the first people he looked to surround himself with? Well, I think the first thing you got to do, Matt, is get your launching pad set. Okay. You know what I mean? Like, figure out who you are, man. Okay. Like, what is your identity? Okay. Who do you belong to? And what matters most to you? You guys know the fourth part of that is discipline. You're going to have to take care of that on your own, man. Maybe you can help with that. Discipline is something that is going to be a relationship that you have with. You're going to have to develop that. But when you're asking me if I move to Oregon, what's the first thing I do? Figure out who I am, who I belong to, and what matters most to me, and then go find people who align with that. I wouldn't be sitting here with you if you weren't about integrity, honor, and accountability. That is my checklist. That is my checklist for who I spend time with. That is my checklist for the words that come out of my mouth. That is my checklist for uh, the investments that I make. Everything I do filters through what a man of integrity, honor, and accountability. And, and that, that honestly protects me and, and helps me make so many decisions so quick because a lot of people won't even bring questions to me if they know, well, Steve's going to filter this through these three things, yeah. it, this one's kind of gray. Don't even bother bringing it to him because I don't get down like that. You've got CEO, CEO of your life. you got to upgrade your human. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about the events that you put together where people can meet you. Yeah, so about two years ago was actually uh, right at the pandemic. Um, I, f I felt the spirit of the Lord pull me into men's leadership. And, uh, and we started a business mastermind called the King's Council about two years ago and to see God's hand on that, to see the businesses explode and so many people, you know, repair their marriages and men rebuild their lives. I mean, it's about all those five things that we talked about mentally, spiritually, emotionally, financially, and, and um, emotionally. Um, so to me, to be able to help men empower themselves to go back to their families and create real change to me is like, that's my purpose, man. You know what I mean? It's not enough for me to go out and win more because I, I prove that to myself. And that's not, I want you guys to understand, this is not me being cocky, but I won enough things to know it wasn't going to make me happy, yeah. right? So if I go out and win more things, it's probably going to give me something similar to what the, all of those other wins gave me. Mm -hmm. But going out and, and helping other people get wins when they've been stopped or they've been stuck before, it's like, you know when Zig Ziglar <laughs> said, man, if you help enough people get what they want, you're going to get what you want. I'm living heaven on earth right now with what I'm doing with King's Council because my heart is just in it, man. I'm helping other people to show up at heaven with their, with their pants empty. I mean, with their pockets empty, you know, when they stand before God and they say, I got nothing left because I leveraged it all. Amen. Awesome, guys. Well, listen, man, we're going to put some links down here so you can connect with Steve at his events. Uh, you happen to be in Frisco, Texas. You happen to be in Dallas, Texas, Frisco, Texas. We go to church at Elevate Life. So we might be seeing him there at church too as well, worshiping and praising the Lord and uh, receiving from Pastor uh, Keith Craft and his son. By the way, his daughter's pretty, is like a mini Whitney. Me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, she's, she's, she's amazing, yeah, she's, man. She's a rock star too. His whole well. family, man. <laughs> that's why I moved here. Like, that's the fruit that yeah, I want in yeah, my life. I exactly. want a family like that, man. Exactly. Where uh, his son loves cheese fries. <laughs> Orange lava burst. Oh, man, that's it. That's it, guys. So let me know your thoughts, your feedback, comments in the section below your question. You agree with us, you don't agree with us, we want to know. Uh, make sure you connect with Steve here also on Instagram too as well. If you're watching this on Facebook, make sure you click like, follow our business page, Money Smart Guy. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you click subscribe, hit notifications, be alerted next time we upload our next episode. On behalf of Steve Weatherford, muscle and fitness, NFL's fittest man, all around stud and warrior for God. I mean, Money Smart Guy, until we meet again. Continue to live smart, continue to love smart, and be money smart today. God bless you guys. Thank <laughs> you.